Hello, Achim Yekarim. How are you? Hope you had a Shavua Tov, Shavua Mevorach, and also a Rosh Chodesh Tov today. Uh, today we're going to talk about the alachot of women for their prayers and when and when to use Hashem's name and when not. Because as we know, the responsibility and role of a woman in Judaism is different than the men's. Uh, un- you know, and, and the major uh, misunderstanding we have in this year, in this uh, generation is that the responsibility of a woman is lesser than a man. And according to the Torah, that's exactly the opposite. As a matter of fact, the uh, woman has a nickname in the Torah called Bait. Bait means home. Because the woman's role is the future success as far as spirituality of the home is, tr- is in, in the hands of a righteous woman. Without a righteous woman that's going to teach the children the uh, Torah, without a woman that's going to uh, make sure that the home has, has spirituality in it and has a shem in it on a regular basis, it's impossible for a Jewish home to succeed in getting closer to Hashem and fulfilling their destiny. Now, the main reason why woman has different halachot is because since she's responsible for such a major task of actually taking care of the home, there's no way that she could also be bound to the mitzvot that uh, are uh, restricted with time. Meaning that, uh, for example, a man has to pray three times a day. He has to pray the shachrit, mincha, and alvit. Each one of these prayers has to be done at a specific time during the day. The shachrit at a certain time in the morning, mincha before sundown, and also uh, alvit uh, after sundown. Now, since the woman is a uh, res- responsible for the house, she has to take care of the kids. There's no way that she could be at the Bet Knesset throughout the entire day. So obviously Hashem knew this, and He explained to the sages that any mitzvah that He has out of the 613 mitzvot we have in the Torah that is bound to time, the woman is not responsible for it. She's not, she's not uh, supposed to do it. Only the man is supposed to do it. And this is also the reason why women do not lay tefillin uh, like the men do in the morning, because that's also part of shachrit. But at the same token, while she is not responsible for those mitzvot, she is responsible to pray at least once per day. But since we cannot use Hashem's name in vain, there are certain prayers that uh, a woman is allowed to say Hashem's name uh, because she's responsible for that prayer. Uh, and whereas there's certain prayers that since they're not part of her uh, daily responsibility... Uh, then our obligation, better said, then she's not allowed to say the name. So here are the alachot, and then Be'ezrat Hashem will go over into the why this is all actually uh, even more more of a meaning, more of a tam, more of a taste of what, the why behind all of it. Because the more we understand the why, the easier it is for us to connect to each one of the mitzvot. Now, as far as the Berkot Shacha, which is the first morning prayers that each one of us does when we first wake up in the morning, thanking Hashem for bringing back our soul into our body, thanking Hashem for making us Jewish, thanking Hashem for all the wonderful things that uh, we have and unfortunately take for granted sometimes. This is the morning prayers. Since everyone is responsible to do it, men and women are responsible and obligated to do it, then the women are obligated to say the name of Hashem. They do use the name of Hashem during these morning prayers. After that, there's the uh, prayers that are before the Kriyat Shema, which are part of the Shachrit prayer, Baruch Shamar, Ishtabach, Nishmat Kol Chai. All of these prayers, since the woman is not obligated to do the Shachrit prayer, then she is, does not use the name of Hashem during those prayers. And then the uh, Kriyat Shema and the Amidah, or also called Tefillat Shema Naisre. Uh, since the woman is obligated to do both of those prayers at least once per day, then, they, then she does use the name of Hashem during the actual Kriyat Shema and during the Amidah prayer. Um, as far as the, uh, the Hallel, Hallel is something that we say during Rosh Chodesh and also during the Moadim, during the holidays. Uh, the woman is, since this is again a time uh, restrained type of uh, mitzvah, the woman does say halel, but she doesn't do the blessing before the halel. So these, so far, these are the actual halachot of prayers for the women. And now I want to make sure that we all understand the why. In today's confused generation, there are many wicked women that are trying to convince the mass public that the role of a woman in Judaism is a sexist or a chauvinistic type of uh, mentality. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. Unfortunately, some women are trying to convince the mass, uh, the mass public that a woman is supposed to be like a man. Now, if I told you that a woman is actually considered more significant than a man in Judaism, then obviously this, this so-called advice wouldn't make any sense. And that's exactly the case. A man needs to learn Torah every single day and do all of these mitzvot and prayers in order to become spiritual, in order to connect to Hashem. A woman does not. And the reason why is because a woman is naturally more spiritual. This is the reason why a man can pray for 20 years without ever crying even one tear, one tear out of his, out of his eyes, without ever connecting to Hashem truly. Whereas a woman, five minutes, five minutes of prayers, if she really wants to, she can start crying for two hours because of how deep she connect, deeply she connected with Hashem. Because a woman is, has a much easier time connecting to Hashem and becoming spiritual. This is also why in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 22, it says, Nekevat esovev gavil. There's several meanings to this. One of them is that the world of the man will be decided by the woman. But nonetheless, also is that the woman can run circles around the man. The woman can actually get to such a high level of spirituality and she is the reason why Hashem took us out of Egypt, not the man. The man actually, unfortunately at that time, were idol worshippers, Reshaim. They were in the 49th level of Tumah and some even worse. The righteous women of Am Yisrael were the reason why Hashem took us out of Egypt. And the righteous women of Am Yisrael are the ones that are going to bring the Mashiach. So all of these foolish thoughts by feminism... By, by, women, by women that are trying to <clears throat> convince women of today that they need to be more like men, <clears throat> couldn't be more nonsensical, couldn't be further from the truth. Also says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1, The wise among women each built her house, but the foolish one tears it down with her hands. This is a pretty strong statement that we can connect to our this week's parasha. It says the wise woman knows what her role is in Judaism and she's going to fulfill that role and therefore build her house. But the foolish one, the feminist, the one that wants to be like a man, her stupid actions, her nonsense, her illusions are going to tear her own house down. How so? We learn in this week's parasha. As we always say, if you ever want to find an answer relevant to your life today, not last week, not last month, not last year, but today, right now, you want to learn an answer that's relevant to you today, you just look at the weekly parasha. Every single week, Hashem, with His divine wisdom, will give us specific, individualistic, custom-made answers for our own problems in the weekly parasha. This is divine wisdom. This is nothing like man. That's why he says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. And this week's parashat Korach, it says, Vayikach Korach ben Yitzar, ben Kihad, ben Levi, vedatan v'ardiram, bnei Eliyah, ve'on ben Pelet, bnei Reuven. Korach, son of Yitzar, son of Korach, son of Levi, separated himself with Atan and Aviram, sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelet, the offspring of Reuven. Korach decided to separate himself from the rest of Am Yisrael, specifically from Moses and Aaron. And he took these other wicked people, the Tan and Aviram, with him, which have been wicked since the start, but also took another person named On Ben Pelet. Later on in Parasha, we learned that obviously this was a very big mistake, despite the fact that Korach, before this foolish action, was considered righteous, was considered wise, and was also very, very wealthy. Before this action, everything was good. After this move, and the, fo- and, and the follow-through of what happened after it, we learn that Korach ends up having such a huge punishment that the ground opened up and swallowed him and everyone that followed him. And they, where they went, they went to Sheol. Sheol is another name for Gehenom. And according to the Gemara, Masichet Sanhedrin, page 109b, Rabbi Akiva says, 
Koach and all of his uh, followers have no share of the world to come. They're going to be in Sheol screaming, Hashem is Emet, Moshe is Emet, and Torah is Emet. Hashem is the truth, Moses' servant is the truth, and the Torah is the truth. Whatever Hashem, stamp something, that's it, it never changes. Rabbi Akiva says he has no share of the world to come. They're going to stay there screaming there until forever. Why? Why did this happen? How could somebody so righteous, so wise, from such a good family, get to such an extent? But the second question is, why don't we see when the punishment is delivered, when Hashem delivers His truthful judgment, why don't we see on the, the name of On Ben Pelet? As the famous story goes, the Chazal explains to us, this was all because of the action of two women. Two women. The wife of Korach said to him, Listen, yes, you're rich, yes, you're wise, yes, you're all of this, but you don't really have the proper amount of kavod, proper amount of respect that you should have. Because look, look at this Moses. He's the number one guy. He made his brother Aaron the number one guy, the number two guy or number one guy also. They're the leaders, then their sons are leaders. What are we? Okay, we have some money, but it's not enough. We need more respect. He says, Yeah, yeah, but look, we went, we're Levis, we have a special responsibility. We had to shave our, uh, our heads and our beards right now because, as, as part of becoming pure. She goes, No, I think they were just making fun of you. They made, uh, they, they made you shave your beard because they were jealous of your beard. And she started putting stuff into his head getting him all crazy. And as it says, the, the woman could run circles around a man. She could make him run in circles also. And that's exactly what happened. Koach lost his mind and says, this can't be. <clears throat> I can't stay this, this uh, number, you know, this, this unrecognized uh, person. I have to get the number one job. And he went and did what he did, went against Moshe, which means he went against Hashem himself, and Hashem punished him. Why? Because of the foolishness of his wife that wanted more kavod. She wanted more recognition. She wanted fame. She wanted to be on the cover of a magazine. She wanted people to take pictures of her. She wanted everyone to know who she is and what she eats for lunch. She wanted all this fame. Okay, well, now she can deal with Gehenom forever and see what, where, where that takes her. This is, this is the foolishness of someone that is chasing kavod. But on the other hand, we had the wife of On Ben Pelet. On Ben Pelet, according to the first verse of this week's parasha, was the original founder of this group. But later on, he's nowhere to be found. Why? Chazal explains to us in Yalkut Shimoni, on the same Proverbs we just read, chapter 14, verse 1, where the wise among women each built their house but the foolish one tears the house down with her own hands. It says, the wise woman here is the wife of On Ben Pelet. And the foolish one is the wife of Korach. How so? The Midrash of Yalkut Shimoni says, the wife of On Ben Pelet convinced him to stay away from Korach. She told him, listen, what's the nafkamina? What's it for you? If, Kor- if Moses stays the leader... You're still in Avrech, you're still learning Torah, you're still fulfilling the will of Hashem. Nothing really changes for you. But if you go with Korach, and he becomes the leader, nothing changes for you anyway. You're still on Avrech, you still learn Torah, you still have fulfilled the will of Hashem. So what's the point of going through this whole battle? Either way, you yourself have the same position. Why go through all this risk? Why go through all this trouble? Even though this wasn't exactly a... Uh, genius advice I mean, this is common sense On never thought of it why? because he was full of the emotions of Korach that resulted from his wife resulted from Korach's wife and he said yes, you know what you're right but I already promised them that I'm going to come she says no, don't worry, I'll take care of that go have a few drinks, go to sleep I'll take care of them how are you going to take care of them? she goes, I'll take care of them and the wise wife of On Ben Pelet went and stood in the front door and as soon as the Korach and his 250 followers came she saw them from afar and she took off her kisui rosh she took off the cover of her hair 
And as soon as the men of Korach saw this, they saw a woman, a, a married woman without covered hair, they immediately ran away because despite being wicked, and despite making a major horrendous decision, they still could not get themselves to ever be next to a woman that's a married woman and is not covering her hair. This is also one of the sources of the mitzvah of covering hair, the obligation of covering hair by married women, and also why it's a scarf or a hat and not a wig like we have many people wear today, even though there are some poskim in Ashkenazi that actually have, have allowed it. We have some material on it online of even the ones that permit the, the covering of the hair. It's not exactly by the wig standards of today. But nonetheless, moving on, we see that here the wise woman of Pelet makes a major decision tells her husband to stay away from the fight and ends up saving his eternity and her own eternity with a simple decision now how could such a simple decision be so extraordinary so life changing the Gemara mentions stories of two women in the Gemara, two major women. One is the wife of Rabbi Akiva, and one is the wife of Rabbi Meir Balanes. The story of Rabbi Meir Balanes is his wife was Buria. Rabbi Meir Balanes was one of the students of Rabbi Akiva, and Buria was also came from uh, Rabbi Hanina ben Tardion, a major sage in Agma, one of the most important men that ever lived. So she came from a good family, she married an amazing husband, and she herself was very, very righteous. But she wanted to make sure that she spends her life, instead of being the traditional woman that has the role of a housewife, that has a role of building the house, and building the Kedushah of the house, she wanted to be an Avrech. She wanted to go to the Kolel all day and learn Torah. Fine, you want to learn Torah? Learn Torah. There's no, uh, it's not a sin. It's a mitzvah. You want to learn Torah? Learn Torah. Just as long as the things at home are being taken care of. But don't forget that you have a critical role. The primary role is taking care of the house. Secondary role is learning Torah. But she made the primary role learning Torah so much so that she became very, very wise. She actually became one of the sages. And she rebuked some of the sages to such an extent that she even kicked one of the chairs of Abimei Baroness's uh, uh, students because she saw that he's studying without, uh, you know, just studying to himself without speaking out loud. When you study Torah, you should read out loud and, and move your lips and not just read to yourself because that uses more senses. But nonetheless, she got to a point where she built this Torah wisdom, but she also built her gava. So when she heard the sages, which got their information from Mount Sinai, say that the mind of a woman is easier to convince than the mind of a man, she started laughing at it. She started laughing. She goes, nah, this is, this is wrong. Now saying something in, in a Torah, something from the sages, something from Mount Sinai is wrong, is a very critical charge. So Abimeir, in order to protect the honor of the Torah, he said to her, I'm going to prove to you that you're wrong. And what he did is that he sent one of his students to show her that she can be convinced. And this student, actually she didn't know obviously he was Rabbi Meir's student, but the student enticed her and to actually become intimate with him. And right before she was willing to do it, or right when she became willing to do it, obviously the student was righteous, he didn't do it. He announced that this is all a test, and she failed this miserable test. This is not because Rabbi Meir wanted to divorce his wife, Chash Shalom. This is not because Rabbi Meir wanted to show his wife that she's nothing, Chash Shalom. This is because he had to protect the honor of the Torah, and no one is allowed to say that something that we got from Mount Sinai is wrong. In order to protect the honor of the Torah, he had to make this step to show her that she's wrong. Ga'avat adam teshpilenu. The pride of man or woman bring his downfall. This is from Proverbs. Shlomo Amelech told us this. So she failed this test and unfortunately she could, her gava, her pride couldn't, couldn't take it that she failed this test, couldn't take it that she was wrong about this thought that she had and she ended up killing herself. A big disaster. There's also another woman in an Agmara 
the wife of Rabbi Akiva, the wife of Rabbi Akiva, fair, very famous story, came from the house of Kalba Savua, one of the three richest men of Am Yisrael. And she left everything behind, got disowned by her father. Why? Because she wanted to marry this man that couldn't read, couldn't write, was divorced with a kid, but had good midot, had good character traits, under the condition that he's going to go to yeshiva and he's going to go learn Torah. She's willing to give up everything. Just so she marries someone that's willing to dedicate their life to learn Torah. And that's what she did. Rabbi Akiva went to school, went to kindergarten, learned the Aleph Bet at the age of 40. And as the story goes, after 12 years he came back, only to overhear his wife talking to this Rasha, talking to this wicked man, trying to convince her to be with him. By saying, look, your husband left, he went to learn, he, whether he went to learn or he's never coming back, you never know. Look at you, you're so poor, you have to sell your hair in order to eat. What do you need this for? And she said, no, if my husband could only hear me, he would do my will. And my will is that he would go back to yeshiva and learn for another 12 years. And because of the honor of his wife, Rabbi Akiva did exactly that and went to yeshiva for another 12 years. 24 years without seeing his wife for a moment. But when he came back, he didn't come back just as Akiva. He came back as the Rabbi Akiva. The Rabbi Akiva that had 24,000 students were the least of his students. The lowest level student that he had was able to have had such kedusha that was able to revive the dead. So when she saw that this big rabbi is coming to town, she knew it's her husband. And this lowly woman is running through the crowd trying to see her husband and no one knows this is his wife. And she goes through the crowd, she's trying to reach the Rav, and the students stop her, hey, hey, lady, what are you doing? This is the holy rabbi. And Rabbi Akiva screamed at everyone saying, no, let her go through. Because all of the Torah that I have, and all of the Torah that all of you have, belongs to her. And this is why when we say, Rachel Imenu, we also are referring to Rachel, the wife of, of Rabbi Akiva. Difference here between these two women, both of them came from righteous houses. Both of them had Torah in their life. The difference here, one wanted to play the role of a man, and one wanted to play the role of the holy Eshet Chayl that we learn about in the Torah, the one that Shlomo HaMelech sings about, the one that we've learned about, Sarai Menu. Rachel Imenu, Leah, Rivka, Ruth, Batsheva, Tzipora, all of these righteous women throughout history. We don't learn about their Torah knowledge. We learn about their Kedusha, their modesty, and how they pre- played a critical role in the building of Am Yisrael. So the most important part about all of this is to know that when we play our role and perfect it, We're fulfilling the will of Hashem. And if we're fulfilling the will of Hashem, nothing in the world is greater than that. Nothing. Thank you for learning Torah with me. May Hashem continue to bless you. And Bezrat Hashem, now we have a little bit more time, a little bit more taste of how special every righteous woman really is.